Hi, Aaron. Hey, how are we? Great, great to have you with us today. We're going through the industry challenges uh, along with the industry content experts that, and mentors that we're going to have on board for Mac Hack 2020. Mm. Yeah, it's exciting. It's getting close now too. I know. Yeah, participants are starting to register and it's all happening. So yeah, really looking forward to the weekend. Yeah, so um, I'll just recap, I guess, the event details. So obviously, Mac Hack, we're disrupting and innovating and solving challenges for the mining industry and sector. And it's on from March 6 to 8. So if you don't have your tickets yet, jump on machack.com.au. Uh, tickets are definitely still available and bring your friends along. Uh, so my name's Aaron. I'm the facilitator for the event. Uh, I'm, my goal is to make this a lot of fun, but also make sure we get some really good outcomes. Uh, we've already had one information session that went through the event in more detail. So I won't dwell on that. You can go back and watch that recording. It's, it's available. Uh, and we have another information session coming up as well next week where we talk more about how to get the most out of the weekend. But today's one is all about the challenges because this event has some specific uh, challenges for you to solve for the sector. And uh, there's prizes up for grabs uh, to solve those challenges as well. So we have five grand of cash prizes, uh, including two and a half for first place. Um, but more than anything else, it's really the opportunity for the ideas, the solutions uh, that get built or tested or validated during the weekend to actually go forward and potentially be trialed. And I think that's the most exciting part because- Yeah, as well as further um, money there for research and development as well. You know, if, if the ideas got legs or solutions got legs, so just to plug there as well. Yeah, and it's awesome that we have so many different industry operators and experts um, involved, including a heap of mentors. So before we sort of go through the challenges, I thought I'd just mention some of the mentors. Uh, but we have representatives from uh, engineering companies like DHG Engineering, from university like CQU, uh, from BMA, BHP, CSIRO, Mastermind, uh, you name it. I feel like we've got a uh, great industry representation and across their skill set, it's really diverse. So we have um, everything from geologists to uh, like data science to people who are more experienced in the HR management side uh, to engineers, obviously, um, and a variety of different engineering uh, talent. Uh, many have long careers in the sector. Some are relatively new, some are focused more on the innovation side. So the beauty of all of that is we're going to have a lot of expertise in the room to provide you with mentoring and coaching and advice, particularly on the Saturday afternoon and again on the Sunday. And just having access to that expertise will obviously help you shape your solutions to make them very specific. Um, they'll, they'll be there to answer your questions. They'll be there to help guide you through the, the challenges and the streams in particular, but also talk about the practical applications. How do we actually implement something in a, what would it look like in a real world environment? What does that environment look like? And that's really important because um, this event is open to anyone to attend. So many of you probably um, will have limited experience with the sector, if any, um, whereas others uh, of you that might be attending obviously have a lot of um, expertise in the sector. But they'll be able to provide insights into um, systems that are used uh, within the organizations, how we might have to integrate our solutions that we develop with those systems. Um, but also then, you know, the commercial reality. So going forward, if, we, if something were to make it into a trial, how, what would that need to look like for that to work? Uh, so the bios of the mentors, I, we have some slides that we can share with more details on the mentors as well. Um, so you'll be able to look them up. You'll be able to see their LinkedIn profiles uh, and read up on their backgrounds as well. Then in addition to them, we also have a panel of judges for the, the final night, for the Sunday night, who again, um, are quite a diverse group representing Metz Ignited, BMC, Glencore, Mastermind, BHP. And again, all with a range of like quite varied expertise um, across engineering, again, through to more the innovation side. Um, and obviously with a, a, a procurement awareness, they understand the procurement process as well. So it's quite an exciting group of people all coming together. I should also mention that in the room, um, there's obviously also, you know, the team from Split Spaces, uh, myself. So there's also a lot of expertise around how do you actually validate ideas? How do you um, prototype a product? How do you um, workshop an idea and, and validate it? And how do you do that customer discovery process while we have these mentors and experts in the room as well? So you're gonna have a ton of support. I and mean, I should also mention we'll have the masterclasses. So over the space of uh, the Saturday morning, there'll be a number of masterclasses to really help you um, further develop your skill set to test an idea, to discover the underlying root causes of these problems and how you might solve them, and then how to convert them into a, a working prototype. 
in, in terms of the actual challenges, so we have some awesome, awesome, awesome challenges. <laughs> um, starting, I'm, I'll, I'll go through the, there's actually five challenges now, isn't there, Deb, with the latest edition? Yes, I can confirm five and we're expecting a couple more to come in as well. So yeah, really exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. And what I love about them is they're quite diverse. So uh, the first challenge I'll talk about is uh, from BHP. So they have this, um, I'm describing it as a water events challenge. And the background to this is during wet season, um, obviously there can be you know, a water buildup, a significant water buildup that can prevent the mine from being operational or even in, you know, introduce hazards on site. And at the moment they're solving that with uh, pumping pits and, and bringing in large scale pumps. And the limitation, the problem around that is that's yeah, great for getting the water out, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. The mine can still be you know, not operational during that time. Um, they, they're still a boggy environment. So what they're looking for is any sort of solution that can help solve this challenge around you know, what's the alternative. At the moment, the pumping solution is obviously dealing with the consequence of these events. How could we prevent these events? How could we better track these events? But they're also looking at you know, in one of their requirements is around how do we measure, for example, the salinity of the soil, um, the effects on the environment, uh, where is this water going and what, what's the flow on effect of pumping this uh, water away and the irrigation consequences. So um, if you have sensor technology, for example, this could be applicable here. Advanced warning technology could be applicable here. Um, there's a range of solutions that might actually fit this. It might be, you know, left field. So I think it's quite a, oh, and the other beauty of this one is there are um, potential trial opportunities at the end of it as well. So quite a significant opportunity. Um, I've seen many mines that get shut down for extended periods with, with this um, one single issue and it's a massive cost. Uh, so there's a huge potential for this one. The, the second challenge is from Mars Mine, and this is more around um, fatigue, so human fatigue. And obviously this is a significant issue. Mine workers, as we know, uh, do shift work. They often do long shifts. Um, some, sh some tasks are quite repetitive or quite arduous. And because of that, the physical toll on the human body um, can be quite high. And also we can just suffer mental fatigue from having to remain focused for so long or, or doing a, a repetitive task. So this represents a, a huge um, safety risk, obviously, but also just in terms of well-being of um, mining workers and mining sector workers uh, and their mental well-being. So at the moment, um, obviously they manage this through uh, shift allocation of times. Uh, they're swiping in and out for tracking of data. Um, basic reporting, looking at, you know, cumulative hours that people have worked. And at, more than anything though, at the moment, you know, from the description of the challenge, it requires individuals to actually report their level of fatigue and to sort of manage themselves. And obviously that self-reporting, there, there could be stigmas around that, there could be all sorts of challenges. So what they're looking at um, in this case, what they've sort of described is some sort of system that could integrate with their time management uh, recording system so that they can get better tracking of data and specifically they've mentioned metrics around you know major travel to or from work or from the mining camp to the site um, minor travel you know around the site itself the amount of time that individuals are spending on site um, the types of work and the times of day when they're working so are they working during daylight hours or is it during night time when our circadian rhythms uh, might be upset by working um, and what sort of breaks are individuals taking? So tracking that data is, is one issue here. Then how does that data get reported? How do we actually manage an alerting system to notify both the individual, but also potentially managers? And again, I'd encourage you to think about what other left field solutions might you know, you be able to introduce here. So there's a you know, big focus around the reporting and tracking, but are there other systems for measuring, for example, a human's um, biometrics to actually detect when they're fatigued because uh, even if we track this work data, people could still be arriving at work having, you know, had a quite a busy weekend or quite a busy holiday and therefore actually, you know, being able to detect the physical symptoms rather than just um, a data analysis of time worked might actually be more valuable. So I'd encourage you to really think broad on these topics, use them as a, as a guide for, you know, how can we solve these, these grand challenges. But I think this one, the beauty of this one for me is there's so many applications beyond the mining sector as well. So when I think of this one, I think of, you know, truck drivers in any industry. I think of airline pilots, um, or train operators. I think of machinery operators, uh, factory operators. It, it has so many potential, um, uh, so many other potential markets or industries that experience a similar problem that you could be solving for. 
So again, huge opportunity. Uh, we challenge two around fatigue. Moving on to challenge three, again from Mastermind. So this one is more about um, information flow. So I get quite excited about this one because I think, again, this has huge opportunities outside of just the mining sector. So what they're talking about here is um, how do they manage communication of information, particularly on a mine site? So, and especially this could be around change of shift, for example. So at the moment, um, what happens is there's these toolbox talks where the information is sort of given to you know, staff at the beginning of a new shift and they communicate the notes regarding safety issues or production issues. It's sort of like all the latest updates on what's happening at the site, um, things they need to be aware of. Now, sometimes these are printed, sometimes these are verbal, sometimes they're handed out, um, sometimes they're given to a supervisor. But the issue here is how do we know the information has actually been received? So how do we know the information has been shared to who needs to know it? How do, they, how do we know that that information has actually been heard and assimilated? And it's almost like, even if the information is shared, how do we make sure it's been understood? Uh, because, you know, often, you know, language, language is so subjective. How do we know that it's been understood in the right way of its intended meaning? So at the moment, the way this is being solved is, you know, these toolbox talks um, conversationally, it could be through, uh, they've mentioned slides and, and videos being used at site, uh, given to crews. They've mentioned um, tablet devices being used while they're on transit um, on buses and other things, or, or just physical printouts of notes. What they're looking for in their description around this challenge is, you know, is there an internet-based model for this? Is there a way that you know, information could be uh, delivered digitally so that it could be tracked in terms of read receipts? Who's actually received this information? When did they receive it? At what time? Um, and particularly, how does that happen in a remote environment? So obviously, the constraints of a lot of these locations is that they don't necessarily have internet access. Um, it's not easy to push data to some of these locations, uh, particularly, you know, if you think of an underground site, how do we get information to those locations? Um, and especially if information is changing fast, how do we make sure it goes out in a, a real time format? So there's some, there's some specific testing requirements that they've listed um, in this one. Obviously what they're looking for is something that is um, independent of weather events, for example, like how, how do we make a system that's robust and reliable? Um, but for sending that real-time information. So they mentioned things like weather alerts, safety alerts, incidents from the previous shift. Um, they also mentioned the ability to update teams and crews with presentations. So it's not just short information, it could be a longer format uh, piece of information or educational content that, that shift workers need to consume. Um, and again, this has to happen both with and without internet connectivity. So again, quite a broad challenge like in some ways it's quite specific how do we get you know this information uh, sharing and receipt um, solved but again it's got so many con um, potential applications into other fields so again I think of the airline industry I think of anything where there's information that needs to be provided in real time so for example emergency services staff um, which are often also shift workers often also working in remote locations um, often where there is an incident that needs updating across their entire workforce or their entire shift crew. Um, now the beauty of this one as well, like the others, is there is an opportunity for um, a trial post the event. So the fact that you could actually come up with a prototype during the weekend um, and see that potentially implemented into a trial um, in the field would actually be obviously incredibly valuable. Moving on to challenge number four. So this is uh, from Syro and this is around detecting um, humans like people on site to prevent uh, human machinery collisions and just basically improve safety by knowing where everyone is. So obviously, uh, you know, mine sites, there's large equipment. Uh, there's a lot of cases where uh, people, we lose line of sight. So we lo lose visibility and line of sight visibility. And it's very easy for um, people and machinery to come into contact with one another. So at the moment, there's a lot of technology out there that's trying to solve for this because it is such a significant issue. and in the um, specification they've sent through for this challenge, they describe some of that technology from LIDAR, which is a, a laser-based radar um, approach, um, through to RFID tags like proximity sensors, uh, camera technology, so CCTV, um, thermal imaging. Th there's actually a lot of different technology that could be used, but in reading through the description, part of the challenge to this is the adoption of that technology. So as in um, challenges around the physical implementation, um, but also like consistency of technology across multiple sites, across multiple 
vehicles across different equipment, meaning that staff aren't necessarily always trained in this technology. So that means there's a lot of opportunity here to actually come up with a holistic solution. Um, oh, I have a second slide, that's why I paused because I forgot the second slide. Uh, so what they're looking for, some of the descriptions they've given here is, you know, potentially this is actually a software solution to integrate different hardware that already exists. Perhaps it is a new um, type of hardware for sensing um, humans in a physical environment. And one example I can share that I saw in Israel was uh, where they could actually, they had technology in Israel that could actually detect an individual's human like identity from their magnetic field signature. So by having a magnetic field sensor in a room, they were able to tell the specific people who were in that room, which sounds quite insane that you can do that. Um, but you know, maybe it is some left field type solution. Maybe it's taking a technology that already exists in some other application and adapting it for this environment. Um, but again, maybe it's just making this technology that already exists more user friendly. Maybe it's the interface with the humans or the operators that's actually the challenge. And that's part of the beauty of this weekend is getting the chance to access these mentors and industry experts and, and the other participants is to actually dive that little bit deeper. What is the underlying cause of these problems? Maybe it's as simple as a, a human error. Maybe it's a training issue. Maybe um, there's some other systemic you know, problem that we actually need to address which will solve the challenge, but it we may perhaps without even using technology. So I encourage you to think quite broad again. Um, this one doesn't have a trial opportunity, but I know how big an issue this is. And obviously safety is a massive issue on sites. I imagine if you can solve this sort of thing, there'd be a number of companies willing to do things and, and trial things later. Yeah, I might just um, hop in there and say, Syro in essence is, as we all know, an organization that is always looking for solutions themselves. So the opportunity for trial, given that the people in the room, you know, are from certain sites, may still exist, but not through CSIRO, the organisation itself, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. <laughs> we also have this fifth challenge, which um, I'm just reading for myself for the first time, um, but this is more around GIS data. So surveying and, and spatial imaging data and mapping data. Uh, and this one comes from, is it from Glencore? Yes, it is from Glencore. So reading through the background on this one, obviously there's a lot of um, imaging data that's available and how do we actually make that data accessible and understandable um, and easy to consume in a very um, quick way? And the other part of this is also looking at historical data. So obviously detecting changes in data. The beauty of this one that I quite like is it looks like they're gonna actually provide some um, test data in different formats. So for those of you that are, perhaps you have a data science bent um, or you're analytical or mathematical, you might quite enjoy this one where you actually get to play with some uh, real world test data and, and sample data. Um, but it's looking at how we can actually, you know, interpret this data. What what can we use for modeling of this data? What can we learn from the data? And conversion of data between the different formats. So obviously we have a lot of telemetry systems in mining sites. There's a lot of um, sensors on machinery and equipment. There's a lot of um, human data that gets captured in some way as well. So subjective data. How do we actually collate all of that into, um, oh, into a system that can actually give meaningful insights? And how can we then get predictive alerts to sit over the top of that data so that we're not just looking retrospectively, but actually having some perhaps algorithms that sit over the data to inform us of things um, that might break before we even are aware that they could or that we that might happen on site before we're aware um, or pick up any of the other symptoms. Um, there's potential to be involved here post so they've, they've written down here, you know, obviously potential implementation afterwards. Um, looking at you know how feasible this tech, this might be able, uh, be to adapt in the field as well. But if you are interested in geoscience, again, this is one where I think it could apply to other sectors. So definitely, you know, when, whenever I hear geospatial data being mentioned, I always think of councils and governments looking at land use. Um, I know the United Nations and uh, the World Bank uh, are constantly looking for how do we analyze drone imagery, for example, to look at deforestation and environmental impact. Uh, so creating something like an algorithm or an interface or a system for correlating different GIS data sets or different data sets over the top of each other um, has so many other applications. So again, much like the other challenges, I think if 
you know, you solve for one group of people having the problem, you're almost guaranteed there's other groups of people experiencing the same problem as well. So that's our five challenges. I'm pretty sure, Deb, we've covered all five there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we ha we have. Well done, Aaron. That was an excellent wrap up of what they are. Um, I just sent you through another one as well. Oh, great. <laughs> so hot off the press. I said to everyone to have them in by lunchtime today. And of course, you know, there's always a few that and, and that's what I said. I expect some more to be coming in. Um, so if you want to go through that one now, I understand that you haven't had a good opportunity to actually uh, run through it. But it's more of a logistical um, challenge which is again something a little bit different to the other challenges that we've had yeah great so i'm just reading through it now so uh in in terms of background what it's talking about is that the, so this is from bhp and it's talking about on mine sites obviously there's a lot of equipment um not just machinery and tools which we always default to thinking about but obviously also furniture um buildings uh even like normal vehicles uh, and other assets um and these are built from suppliers all around the, the, the globe. Uh, but what they're looking at is how can we actually lower the carbon footprint by sourcing these, um, th this equipment locally from local vendors. And so obviously there's a, there's a great environmental impact to this one as I'm reading through it. They're looking at you know, carbon footprint reduction. They're looking at um, you know, local vendors and providers who could potentially manufacture or who already um, build this equipment. They also mentioned in terms of the current practices, they talk about you know existing workers um, and after hour emergency deliveries for unplanned um, stays away. So in other words, how do they get equipment to people after hours or, or when a local vendor doesn't have enough stock to um, deliver in the time frame needed? They're also looking at um, alternative ways to get delivery direct to the mine site. So rather than, in other words, improving their supply chain. So rather than coming through perhaps warehousing or a head office or other location, a storage shed, how do they actually get equipment delivered directly to the site that needs it? And what they're, so what they're looking for is, this could be a framework, um, as in, you know, it could be a process improvement. It could be a, an improvement to their procurement process, for example. It could be a, a system. So it could be some sort of system to actually optimize all of this. Um, so for example, a, a um, procurement, um, algorithm that sits over the top and looks at all the vendors, looks at where equipment is needed, looks at the transport that's available and automatically determines the optimal purchase. Uh, and many of you would know that when we're buying things, we often just look at the, the cost or you know, the vendor itself. But when you take into account all of the other costs of getting a product into the field and where that's not just financial cost of the product, but you're looking at logistical cost. But when you factor in the carbon cost, like the actual environmental impact of buying from a supplier who then has to truck it a certain distance as opposed to someone else that's local. And if you then have to store it at a particular location and potentially there's an environmental impact of that, or if it has to be powered during transport and there's a consumption of electricity to maintain uh, the product or equipment, then when you take full account of the extended cost to the environment, suddenly your procurement calculations completely change. And so I, I pick up on here that they're really looking at the, the complete impact from a you know, their carbon footprint impact. So how do you come up with a procurement system that actually um, takes account of all those expenses, not just the, you know, the dollar cost, but the full environmental cost. It says here as well that if a viable solution is found, um, that potent I mean, they mentioned that potentially Mackay City Council would be interested. I actually know a lot of companies that are very interested in their carbon footprint impact and looking at, you know, procurement more holistically beyond just the product price. Uh, so I think if you solve this, I think there'd be a lot of companies quite interested in uh, a system that could actually improve their carbon footprint around their physical assets, procurement of assets, and probably also disposal of assets as well. Um, they mentioned here that there might be an opportunity to speak to a BHP rep around you know, emissions data, um, which they might be able to get their hand on. But again, like the other challenges, I think the beauty here is you could, you could look at this from a systems point of view. How do we improve the system? You could look at it from developing um, almost like an AI, AI algorithm, like how do you get the data set of impact and then you know, do some, um, put some smarts behind it to actually do smarter procurement based on the total environmental impact. Um, but maybe also it's just a strategy. Maybe it's an educational process in terms of educating procurement staff or asset managers 
um, or those who are responsible for fleet management, for example, in terms of a vehicle fleet. Maybe it's a, an educational process. Maybe it's a sensor um, technology that's needed. Uh, so yeah, again, quite, quite a broad one that has a lot of applications to other industries. Six pretty cool challenges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep, there may be a couple more to come. I guess we'll just have to stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, you may be able to touch on those at next week's webinar. I know next week we're going into how to get the most out of the weekend. How do you collaborate? Uh, big thing, obviously, if you come up with an awesome solution, which we are sure that there will be some great outcomes from the weekend. How do you manage IP? You know, how do you have those conversations about all of that before even going into forming a team? Yeah, and, and and how do you just prepare to get yourself to the event to get the most out of it? You yes. know, like make sure you yeah. get some sleep before and <laughs> what equipment to bring. So we'll answer all of those questions in the next one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I think, you know, what stands out for me from these six challenges is there's sort of a role there for everyone. I mean, if you're interested in sustainability around that last one, natural environment, um, you know, if you're into um, geospatial, if you're into data, um, but if you're into... Um, you know, a lot of the other ones around safety, around sensor technology came up a lot. Um, in fact, the water around the first one was, has some um, you know, good interest for environmental, people are interested in environmental issues. So yeah, there's, there's quite a range there. Oh, and communications and information flow, human mm, dynamics. I agree with you as well, Aaron. And I think that, you know, one of the questions that often comes up is that, well, why, why would I get involved? I'm not sure I have anything to offer as much as Just I would. Just this last week, someone yeah. said, I'm not a hacker. Yeah. I'm not a hacker. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, like there's so many different perspectives that you can look at a challenge from. Mm. And so the greater um, diversity within the room and within each team, you know, everybody brings something to a solution and you don't have to be a hacker. You only need one hacker on your team <laughs> yeah. you know? and then you need all of those other aspects as well. And, and um, yeah, I think it's going to be really fascinating how we, how we get the teams all together on the Friday night. Cause of course, um, you know, if somebody's coming by themselves and are a little bit unsure about, well, how do I even get in a team? How am I going to meet these people? Yeah. You, know, you do all of that. That's your role, right? You make people feel comfortable and, and, and allow the teams to be able to form. And, and I guess with this one, they're forming around the challenge as well. So mm. you maybe just spend a couple of minutes talking about and, and alleviating some of those fears of individuals who will be coming by themselves in how they're gonna actually form a team. Yeah, so you, there's so many great points in what you just said. I, I think starting with the fact that every single human on the planet has value to contribute to this event. It actually doesn't matter what experience base you're coming from, what industry base you're coming from, the fact that you might have a different perspective is enough to contribute. And I can't emphasize that enough because particularly, you know, when you work in an industry and do something every day, you have that one narrow view. You don't have the advantage of seeing how other industries have solved things. Or um, So for those of you that aren't in the mining sector, what you will bring is this incredible external view of a different approach to solving a problem. Um, but also your particular skill set. So it's funny how we immediately think technology when we think of building a solution, but often the solution that's needed is more often around a, a human challenge. It might be a communication challenge. It might be, you know, if people actually understood their personality profiles and communicated better, we might actually solve this problem. Um, sometimes it's more procedural. So if, if you might you know, be an HR uh, rep inside a, a small business, but you've built a world's leading practice of HR and staff management by building certain procedures and just those procedures, that approach to a structural method of breaking down something that happens um, could be what's actually needed to solve some of these challenges. So absolutely, regardless of uh, what you perceive as your value, I guarantee you have a ton of value to, to deliver at the event. The second part of that is what you'll take away from the event. So even if you don't intend on carrying something forward after the event and you're thinking, look, I, I have no interest in building a solution for the mining sector. Um, I'd encourage you to think about what you will learn during the weekend and you'll learn skills, you'll learn perspective, you'll learn challenges in other industries and go into great detail around them and how to solve them. And all of that, when you go back into your day job or your normal life on Monday morning, you can apply that same lens, that, that ability to think that way, what you might see or what another participant might share with you about how to solve a problem or a particular approach, 
you'll be able to take into your day-to-day life. I absolutely guarantee it. Um, I facilitated 60 plus of these things and every single time I learn at least three new skills by attending. And often those skills I learn are actually from participants, like they're peer to peer. Uh, And that's the beauty of these events is you just don't know what you'll get out of it. But I encourage you to think about how you'll change as a human and that lasts with you forever, regardless of whether your idea or solution, you know, wins on the night, doesn't win on the night, goes forward, whatever, you are better for the experience. Uh, So absolutely, yes, definitely attend. and yeah, just have a lot of fun. I think that's the main thing. Just just come in with that lens of, hey, this is a big experiment. Let's see where this goes. Uh, and that curiosity to hear new ideas and different opinions and perspectives. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is you, you'll, you'll meet new people that you will connect with and stay connected with after the event. Uh, so I've made amazing friends all around the world uh, through hackathons who I stay in touch with like five, six, seven years later. Uh, some very close friends and it is because you have this bonded shared experience, but you get to know each other really quick. And uh, I'm, I've known so many participants who end up, you know, they might come through the weekend. They might even be on different teams during the weekend. And two years later, they end up forming a company together or one gets employed by the other, um, or they make introductions for each other, um, or they, it might be paid work that they do for each other. Um, there's so many things that can come out of it. It's just a, it's a melting pot of human awesomeness. So um, yeah, just come along and have fun bring an open mind. Great. Excellent. Anything you want to add to that, Brent? Yeah, just make sure you register. Oh, I think yes. There's a cutoff time for registration. <laughs> what, is the, what is the last date someone can register? Well, it depends whether you want to get fed or not. <laughs> <laughs> ideally, uh, ideally, people will get in and register as soon as they decide that they are going to commit, you know. Yeah. Um, so the sooner we can get those numbers uh, confirmed, the easier it is for everybody. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. we look forward to seeing you for MacHack 2020. Looking forward to having you, Aaron, here in Mackay. Um, it's going to be a great long weekend. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, welcoming everyone to Split Spaces, our co-working and innovation hub in Mackay, and, uh, and making sure that everyone has a fantastic weekend where they all feel safe and comfortable to contribute and uh, walk out the door at the end of the weekend feeling like they've accomplished something they never thought they could. Mm. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys uh, hanging out with everyone uh, for the for the weekend. Yeah, can't wait. Sweet. All, All right. right. Well, we'll um we'll close it there, and we'll see you this time next week for how to get the most out of the weekend. Yeah, chat then. And ideally, we'll have so many registrations that we'll have to close them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Thanks.